DT. Dave. And Lorenzen heading that way. Now making it up as he goes. He got it! Tommy Cook for two. Try for an eight-point lead. Cobbs a tailback, Peters in motion. And all day for Jones. His backyard play converted by Jason Peters. Well, and been... Arkansas up by eight. Four wide, and Lorenzen keeping again. Doesn't get it. Where do they mark him? He lost it. And Arkansas, Tony Bua comes away with it, and Arkansas comes away with the win in seven overtime. I guess we can just start off with like on the Jared Lorenzen side. So I'm 38 years old and it, I didn't, I didn't realize when I was, until I was doing a little bit of homework and rereading re your article, you know, that, you know, I knew he died at a young age, but you know, obviously Jared Lorenzen passing away at the same age that I am is <laughs> mind blowing, you know, kind of like him playing football is really mind blowing. Yeah. So, you know, he was always, an outlier, right? I mean, he was the biggest kid. Almost every team he ever played on, probably at least till he got to the NFL, maybe even at Kentucky, you know, playing quarterback at 300 pounds, as you guys know, is just uh, unprecedented. And um, I think he his, his skills, in a lot of ways, punched his ticket to let him live a kind of life that was unhealthy for him. He was so talented. And he had such a big arm and could still run, you know, and all those sorts of things that that enabled him to live an unhealthy lifestyle in a lot of ways. And, you know, a bunch of the stuff and the story I wrote was about him just like going crazy to make weight at different times in his career. You know, his coaches would want to make him learn to make a certain weight. And he would do all this crazy stuff, like put on like four sweatsuits and run for 10 miles and he'd have a bottle with him that he just spit into just to get out those last few ounces. And then he would make the weight and then immediately just binge again and eat again. And so he was able to just do what he had to do to stay on the field. But that whole cycle in his life was incredibly unhealthy. And then once he didn't play anymore, you know, there was no, nobody was telling them to make weight for anything. And so it all just, you know, ballooned on the other end. It's kind of like the gift and the curse. So like football gave him something to look forward to or to kind of keep the weight in check a little bit, but also it was kind of like his biggest enemy because, you know, when he had to make Little League weight, weighing, weighing the right amount, I think he had to gain weight then, he got rewarded with a plate of brownie, you know? Right. Um, College, I'm sure we've got, you know, we all got personal stories. And when we play football, how, you know, being player of the week, besides just the bragging rights, like that got you a free meal. Like, and you realize really quickly, like, I can be fed by football by just who I am. You know, by throwing up touchdowns, I can just stand in the Burger King. Somebody be like, man, throw big guys some burgers. Um, and I think this is one of the things that ultimately was kind of the gift and the curse for Jared, because, you know, without football, Nobody's. It would be different if it was drinking or smoking cigarettes or drugs or something. But when you're talking about food, oh, we all got to eat, man. So let Jared let Jared eat a little bit. You know what I'm saying? And I think that's that's something that was that was tough for him to handle. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the culture in a locker room, certainly among the bigger guys, is you know you everybody eats a lot. The linemen eat a lot, and the linebackers eat a lot. And Jared was the size of those guys. And so he could, you know, partake in all that. And I think also for him, his size was what got him noticed. Yeah. You know, if he had been um, a 220 pound quarterback with the stats he had, he would have been really good. I mean, he set some SEC records when he was at Kentucky, that sort of thing, but nobody would remember him the way they remembered him 
as being a 300 pound quarterback. And so that in itself, I think, you know, became part of his legend, part of his personality, um, all those sorts of things. And it, you know, it built on itself. I think he enjoyed that attention. He reveled in that attention and that sort of led him into indulging his bad habits. Right. Um, I think about myself from that kind of transition of being a, the kid who was big and husky, you know, elementary, middle, and then you start to realize there's a place for you in the world, you know, on the football field, and that goes, that moniker from being big and husky to big and strong and big and whatever. But we all know that being bigger doesn't necessarily make mm. you stronger. And I think that's really interesting um, that maybe that was one of the reasons why he never really wanted to drop the weight because again so much of that was tied into his identity yeah he'd always be a tall dude but just being a big dude and also i'm thinking about it now is like there's a lot of quarterbacks i wouldn't i mean he's probably one of the few quarterbacks i wouldn't want to challenge in a fight <laughs> you know what i'm saying one because i tried right. to one before but like is that some kind of psychology you think that why he always like kept that identity be just being the big guy? Um, Cause it like, you know, it keeps, keeps the riffraff off. You I mean it's. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I don't think Jared was much of a fighter, no, 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 no. but you know, as being, you know, the big guy who walks into a room every once in a while, there's somebody who wants to take on the big guy, but most of the time you get left alone. Mm -hmm. And so I think maybe that played into it too, is that, you know, as the as the literal big man on campus, you know, he could wander around and, and sort of, you know, have a little bit of distance between him and other folks. And I think, um, you know, I think he enjoyed that. I mean, he definitely liked the attention. There's no question about that. He liked being on camera. He liked the TV games. You know, he likes people noticing him um, and all that sort of thing. And being his size played into all that. And so I think that was a, a disincentive for him to, to get healthier. Yeah, something, Pete? Yeah, I, I just think that's really important because, I mean, I can speak for myself, and there's probably a lot of guys who, you know, are bigger guys. You know, like you say, if you walk in a room, nobody's really going to bother you. So you don't even have to figure out whether or not you're a fighter or a tough guy. Not You just can kind of, Take your way through <laughs> through life. You don't even have to, you know, you don't even have to do that. So that's really interesting that you bring up that point. Uh, that that was just that was just one of his identities that he just walked around the world with. Yeah, I mean, I think you know, uh, sometimes your size gets you noticed, and if you're not the type of person who likes to get noticed, it could be a bad thing. But if you're the type of person who likes attention, then I think it it can be a real gift and he liked attention. And so knowing that everybody knew him, not just on campus or when he walked into a bar or something, but he was known around the SEC and around the country. Here's the 300 pound quarterback. And I think he he definitely enjoyed that, that, that kind of attention. Yeah, um, and I'm thinking about the times I've interacted with him when he was doing the sideline stuff and I was doing some reporting where like, he really relished that. He really, uh, you know, understood. And, th and that was smart of him. He sold some T-shirts and he, you know, he did a lot of things to capitalize on that. But that also gave him a convenient excuse to, you know, to, to stay the big guy, to stay the big jovial, you know, as opposed to like saying, yeah, I want to say some stuff and stay relevant, but I need to be losing this weight too. Um, it was just a convenient kind of cop-out for him. I think one of the things... I know this was true for me. When you're big and you've always been big, like Jared was always big, you don't know how your life is going to change if you get smaller. You know, you think that you get smaller and healthier and everything's going to be better, but that's not necessarily um, a sure thing. You know, what if you crave the attention and nobody cares about you anymore if you're 220 pounds? You know, and I think that's one of those things that you can can get in your head a little bit. I'm sorry, there's somebody cutting grass out here while I'm trying to talk, but um, that's one of the things that can get in your head a little bit, I think, 
when you're trying to make any kind of big change is, am I gonna, am I really gonna be better off for making this change? Right. Or is making this change gonna alter my way I see the world or the way people see me in some way that makes things worse? And I think you could talk yourself out of doing things that are beneficial to you because the status quo feels safer. And it's always a risk to make any kind of a big change. And I think there was probably in his mind some kind of risk, risk, excuse me, some kind of risk that if he became healthy and walked around at 220 instead of 320 or 420, would people care about him anymore? It's a great question. Um, some of the things that stuck out to me uh, when talking about his wife and their relationship where, you know, they – you know, they had a couple of disagreements and different things like that. But one of the things that, you know, really stuck out to me was he said, it's like, you know, really, I don't have anybody to live for now. You know, even though she I, she's I love her. She I respect her. We got kids together. You know, I'm still a young guy. But like, you know, that's when I really that's in his words. I started just chomp, 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 you know just kind of like an alcoholic. They tell you, you know, don't go, alcoholics, you know, go to the bar and drink by themselves or go in there, drug addicts go in their little corner and do what they need to do. But when it comes to food, um, nobody's going to get mad if they see Jared Lorenzen go to the store three, four times a day because he's supposed to eat, right? And this is, right. again, the double-edged, slippery slope where, you know, it all goes back to emotional eating, his feelings, a lot of those different things. And again, that's, that's something he was known to do even growing up because even talking about a relationship with his father and, and his divorce with his mom or with his wife at the time and all those different things, how he handled it. Yeah, I think he didn't have uh, the greatest you know, family situation growing up and then sort of remodeled that you know, in his own life. And um, you know, I think you know, as he was growing up, food became sort of an emotional support for him like it does for a lot of us. And then as he got older, got married to this woman who, as you said, was you know, the love of his life, his high school sweetheart, he couldn't control his impulses enough to save that marriage. And then when they split, then he had no reason to slow down. And so that, you know, made it even worse. And so, you know, I feel like if he had just found a way to hold on a little longer he and his wife had found some way to hang in there a little bit till he got a little healthier, you know, maybe things would have been different for him, but you know, at some point when you're the spouse or the partner or the family member, you know, you can't wait forever for the other person to change and you can't hold on to some ideal of what they might be someday um, when they're not showing any particular willpower or interest in being that way. And so I think that breaks up a lot of families, you know, any kind of addiction or a compulsion or whatever it is. And it is worse on all sides because she didn't want to leave him either, you know, right. but they couldn't find a way to keep it together. And so it made things worse for both of them. Can you, can you speak to that, that concept of like uh, emotional eating or emotional support? One of our teammates, he said that he didn't really get, he doesn't get uh, depressed in the traditional sense of the word. It's like, you know, things about him personally, but when he starts to sort of feel things about the world at large, that's kind of when he felt like he uh, started to go in. Can you, can you expound on that concept a little bit? Sure. Uh, I think for those, uh, for everybody, but especially for those of us who have issues with food, Food, more than anything else, is a comfort. You know, when things are bad, it, it soothes you. You know, in the same way that, you know, somebody who drinks, you know, you go have a couple of drinks and it sort of takes your mind off things. Uh, if, I, if I'm having a really bad day or if the news in the world is really bad and I go have a pint of ice cream or something like that, at least in that moment, I'm doing something that makes me happy. And I, th and, and I think that's the emotional trade-off with anything that's addictive is that you trade off, you accept the long-term consequences of what it's doing to you for the short-term comfort of something making you happy. 
Why do we do this to ourselves? Every time we get depressed, we eat and eat and eat. Don't you? You go to the store and you buy those little candy bars in the bag, and before you know it, the whole bag is empty. And then at the end, you feel just like that bag. Empty inside. So you're taking that 15 minutes or whatever it takes to eat whatever's bad for you. That makes you happy for 15 minutes. And then you put off the long-term consequences of that, which you know. I mean, I knew, Jared knew, anybody who does this stuff knows that's coming. But you can make yourself forget about it for a while. The thing about food and, and other, other stuff too, but I think especially food, that makes it so kind of insidious is, it's also the thing you do when you're happy to celebrate, right? So you have a birthday party, you have a cake, you know, you have, you're going out with your friends, you go get a steak, you know, you're hanging out on the porch with your buddy, you have a couple of beers, whatever it is, you know, food is there on both ends of the spectrum and you're sort of likely to overindulge on both ends. And so that makes it really difficult because, you know, it's there for you all the time. That's a really interesting way to put it when you say it's there for you on either end of the spectrum. Because, like you said, if I'm sad, eat my feelings. If I'm happy, eat my, you know, so, and, and, and I always really give this scenario, um, especially for football guys, is because good, bad, worst game of your life, best game of your life, through six picks, through six interceptions. You're going to get a bag of McDonald's at the end of the game, or you're going to get a pizza on the on the plane, or you could have had the best workout or the worst workout, but they're going to make you a big 64-ounce uh, shake in a bar, and then, you know, you can go get some lunch afterwards. So, you know, that reward, all of that is, mm -hmm. is interwoven mm -hmm. in there, and it's really tough to try to figure out some different ways to, to, to break that mold. Because, again, like you said, here you are sitting in the middle, and either way you tilt, on that on that spectrum, you know, can lead you, especially when you're talking about food. Um, that could be really tough for you. Yeah, I think one of the things that's difficult for athletes is that until you get to probably the college level, but maybe even the pro level, um, there's not enough people talking to you about nutrition. Right. You know, and so you do, you get that junk food all the time, you get the pizzas after the games, all that sort of thing. And it adds up, right. you know, even if you're working out all the time, even if you're, you know, sweating at a, at a, you know, collegiate athlete or pro athlete level, all that stuff adds up. And it seems like in some ways, it's only the most elite athletes who really figure out that taking care of your body is the way to stay that way, to stay in that elite level. Um, and, and, you know, to be honest, to do that can be pretty expensive. You know, to eat really healthy and to watch what you're doing and to eat the right, you know, organic stuff or whatever, that's not nearly as easy or cheap as just a bag of McDonald's. Right. And so More you know, to do that, yeah, to do that requires not just you paying attention, but like the team paying attention and the coaches paying attention. It's easy for them too just to go to McDonald's and get you guys, you know, burgers for 80 or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's harder to prepare and figure out a meal that will get you guys the nutrition you need, but also keep you from, you know, eating unhealthy. Yeah, really interesting. What's really interesting now on the, on the college level, whereas they didn't necessarily talk to the students. Now they're preparing them. They're giving them great food, but they're not, necessarily giving them the, the skills or the why are we eating this stuff so they're eating good stuff but you know as soon as they walk across the stage or finish that eligibility it's going to be real easy to go back to what you were doing in high school or before yeah i've seen you know i think there was a story in the athletic a couple of days ago um you know it seems like linemen especially either get way bigger or way smaller you know there's like no in between like i know um Jordan Gross, who played for the Panthers, was all pro, you know, tackle for a long time. I know when he retired, he lost like 100 pounds, 150 pounds or some crazy yeah. amount because he just stopped eating those like 5,000 calories a day that were required 
to keep him at the weight that he needed. I guess maybe it depends on what your body type was before. You know, if you are a naturally big person and then you can eat whatever you want, you know, maybe you tend to balloon up. But if you are naturally a smaller person who always had to bulk up, you may go the other way. Yeah, that's that's sort of it. Um, because you know, one of our one of our teammates in you know, uh, Charlotte Panther, Travell Warren, uh, you know, yeah. Travell's Travell's walking around right now like around two fifty and he lost a you know, he lost a, a lot of weight. And uh, you know, for him, it, it he it took him a couple of years to get the get the memo, so he didn't do it immediately after he finished playing. But uh for him it had to be a, a concentrated effort to do it because he was sort of a naturally bigger guy that, that really had, you know, that had to work to keep weight off, whereas opposed to maybe Jordan had to work to keep the weight on. So, yeah, it's really interesting how that how that works. Yeah, I think the guys like you talk about Travell, I think that's much harder, you know, if you're a naturally big guy, um, but, but you can't walk around in the world at 330 or whatever he played at, you know, to, to get down to a healthy weight when your body's, sort of fighting that, that's really difficult. This idea of uh, of willpower and saying no, um, being mentally tough, like, like we, I know any football player has to be really strong, but, you know, they can go out there and, you know, run and do all these physical things. But when it comes to your vice, especially when something that's accepted as food, um, you know, it's tough because people are looking at it and saying, man, Jared's so big and so strong. Why could why can't he just say no? Why can't he just turn it down? But, you know, it's 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 tough because some of it is chemical, some of it is habit, nostalgia, you know, how he coped with things as a kid. Uh, but also one of the things you kept mentioning in the article was just being responsible, being a grown-up. Like, and I think that's right. really that's tough. And I never think about, I never, till I started reading your book, Elephant in the Room and your articles, um, I never thought about food like that. I think about it when it comes to money. I think about it when it comes to relationships, being responsible, but like, you know, being responsible for food. I'm the adult. I'm the one that gets to choose every day. You are, because you're at, you are there at every meal going into your mouth. But a lot of people, I don't think, resonate and think about that like that and just say, why you just can't, why couldn't you just tap in and be strong and just have willpower? But as we all know, you're gonna run out a bunch of no's if you've if you've done the right thing up to three o'clock. You're like, man, I, I think I'm out of no's for today. You know, maybe not that literally, but like, you know, there goes those French fries. Damn, I'm making the beeline into the to the drive through. Yeah, it's really hard, and I think you know, I I didn't play college level sports, so I might be speaking out of turn here, but I've always thought that sports, in some ways, for the players is this sort of extended childhood, you know, where you get to play a game and you get to do something that, you know, people did as kids, you get to keep doing that. And because of that, you have stuff like training tables where people, you know, bring you food every day and you get to um, have this sort of interactions with teammates and stuff that other people in other businesses, other lines of work, don't really get to have. Obviously, when you get to the level you guys got to, it's a man's game, but it's still sort of a a child's game too. And I wonder how many players, you know, use that as an excuse in some ways to sort of act that way around food. You know, that, you know, I'm I'm still playing a game. And so I get to eat like a kid because I'm playing a game like a kid. And that sort of thing. And it's not even necessarily a rational thought. Wow. Um, it's just something that's, you know, part of your mindset as you get to do this thing that so many other people wished they got to do, um, that that's part of it too. And I think that even extends to people around the game, like coaches, you know, uh, people around it, even media people, you know, just being around it. You know, I know as a sports writer, the, sports writing I've done, it does feel like, you know, they always talk about newspapers, the sports section is the toy department, you know, and and, uh, sometimes you do feel like really lucky, like a kid getting to get paid to go cover 
sports. And part of that life is there's always a lot of food around and that people are giving you, which most people in most lines of work don't have access to. And so I think just that whole scene sort of, sort of is an incentive to people to continue bad habits that maybe if they had been doing something else for a living, they would have dealt with by then. That's really interesting because, like you said, you've covered sports and, um, you know, covering sports in the South, too, is big difference between, say, the <laughs> Northeast or, the, or the, the Northwest or even out in California where, you know, it's just, it's funny how much geography plays a different part. Um, so you got the the confluence of, you know, if you're a sports writer, how you usually watch the game, you know, with some type of food or beverage, but you're at work. So, but then you're also like sedentary, but then you got probably one of the best seats in the house. Cause if you're in the press box or if you got the ability to go mm-hmm. down, it's like, yeah, man, of course I'll have some popcorn and then, you know, six cups of Coke cause they got a fountain machine right over here. And, you know, as somebody who was trying to change, you know, their diet as they cover sports, was that like, was that kind of like an alcoholic going into like a bar or, I mean. I, like, you're, I, that's a really good way to say it. You know, the press boxes are, um, you know, they want to, they want people to be happy correct. in the press box. Correct. And so they lay out a huge spread <clears throat> everywhere you've been. And I think you're right. It is bigger in the South. You know, I've been out West covering games. They might have like hot dogs and stuff. But here it's like barbecue and mac and cheese and, you know, ice cream afterwards. And there's always like popcorn and brownies and stuff sitting around. And sometimes there's beer after the game and all that sort of thing. And it's just constantly available. And so it was hard as as I was trying to get, starting to try to get healthier to walk into some of those press rooms and figure out, you know, what can I eat? And generally, there was something there. Right. Like they would always have a salad that, you know, most people were skipping or some green beans or something. And, that, and so I would get a little of the barbecue or whatever the big thing was and then, you know, get the green stuff. And and then I would have to say, OK, that's all I'm getting. Because otherwise, what you see in the press box is. Every commercial break, you know, halftime, quarter breaks, whatever, half the people are getting up and going to the snack line to see what they've got now. You know, and you see somebody bring bring by some big, like, ice cream sundae or something, and everybody's like, oh, man, the ice cream's out. And there's, like, a stampede to the ice cream. And, and at those moments, you know, usually if you're facing the field, obviously, your back's to all that. And so I just had to keep my back turned. You know, if I turned around and looked and saw it there, I was in trouble. As long as I kept my back turned, I could sort of pretend that it didn't exist. And so that was a a big key for me. It was just kind of pretending it wasn't there. And it also strikes me that, you know, sports writing is different than just regular writing because it's kind of pressure packed, right? It's kind of, there's a pressure, there's there's a feeling towards it. And like you said, one of the ways to relieve that pressure is to kind of have something to snack or drink on while you're trying to write the story before a deadline that's actually happening in front of you. It's not like other journalism, so I imagine that's a that's part of it also. Yeah, there are lots of lots of journalists who work on deadline, but you know, especially in the old days when newspapers were a bigger deal, you know, covering a night game, you know, like South Carolina would play at night all the time, and so covering that game. The game might last till 1030 or something, your deadlines, 1130, and you really got to get bang something out, get it, make deadline, all that sort of thing. And by that point, you're not even like it's not your mind's not even working anymore in terms of like what you're eating. You might have like a, a big box of fries right next to you and you're just jamming them into your face as you're trying to write. And so that's those are the the real danger points when you're not paying attention. You know, I I tell people all the time, you know, one easy way to get healthier, to eat healthier, is to put your phone in your pocket, put down, if you've got a book or something, just put that aside and pay attention to what you're eating. 
Because if you're looking at your phone and you're eating at the same time, all of a sudden, all that stuff is gone and you forgot it was even there. And it, was, it wasn't as satisfying. And so you may crave something else to you know, go with that. And so all those things, that deadline pressure, all that sort of thing definitely plays a part of it. And then when you're off the deadline and you're sort of like, you know, like breathing hard in, in, a, in a mental sense anyway, well, there's still some food over there and it's time to go dive in. Right. So either the stress of it gets you, you're eating to kind of try to stay awake or the other things get you, the smell or you, for me, I hear the ch- with the soda machine in the back. So I know um, I'm getting a little thirsty just thinking about it, you know, Um, or like you said, somebody visually could walk by it. But even for you guys in the press box, like you guys are similar to like a locker room because a lot of the guys who you will see at this sporting event, you'll see them in a couple weeks at this sporting event. And then, so, I mean, we all know each other. It's kind of, you know, maybe not as personal as a locker room, but you know if Willie's having a, if he's on a diet or, you know, so and so's over here, and it's and that makes it a lot harder because you know, just like in the locker room, we're mm-hmm. razzing guys, just like y'all razz. Oh, you back on that diet again, huh? Oh man, oh, yeah. next week when we go to Clemson, they got those blondie brownies. We'll see, you know, and, and it's that's the tough part, right? Well, and the and the difference is obviously that we're not burning off like five thousand calories playing a game, right? You know, we're burning like five calories in the press box. You know, I, I still remember covering a couple of of uh, South Carolina games. You know, you guys, I don't, if they still play on the same day of the state fair, mm-hmm. you know, and so you go to the state fair and you get all that stuff, you know, the fried Oreos or whatever, and then you just walk next door to Williams Bryce and they got the press box laid out. I mean, that's like a double header, you know, and so that's like a really, you know, a really bad day. It's a great day to eat. It's a bad day for your health for something like that. And so, you know, all that, that, like you said, that culture of, you know, this kind of traveling road show of all the press guys, you know, who know each other and razz each other and, you know, sit together and eat together and all that sort of thing. It can be really hard to be healthy and disciplined in that situation. Yeah, you're going to have willpower and you could have looked yourself in the mirror before you walked upstairs and be like, I don't care what so-and-so says, man, from the AP. I am ai don't care if he laughs at my salad this week, man. And you got to <laughs> But like, it can wear thin on you because, you know, maybe you're having some issues at home. And, you know, again, back to that, 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 that scale, like we talked about, you know, trying to balance yourself in the middle and not lean one way too much to the right or to the left. Um, swinging it back around to Jared, I I always thought about, you know, Covington, Kentucky, uh, Ohio, you know, it's kind of just like similar to South Carolina, the the, the corridor of shame, Um, you know, number one for obesity, diabetes, all that. Covington is all similar like that. I wonder if a guy like Jared grew up more in like Ohio farmland or maybe Western, West West Virginia farmland, as opposed to a, a suburb city. Would it have been different for him? Because a lot of his stuff was processed food, cookies, cakes. But, you know, had he been a farm guy, he still might have been big, but not having that access to it might have been something that might have changed that. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. You know, kind of his geography destiny, you know. Um, I, I do think that, I mean, he grew up, his family wasn't poor, like they weren't in poverty, but they weren't wealthy. They were sort of middle class, blue collar family and a divided family right and so I think he lived sort of in sort of the outskirts of the suburbs a little bit um you know not a not an inner city kid by any means but not in the country either mm-hmm. and and so he he had a fairly soft life in that sense growing up where he didn't have to work really hard he didn't have like farm duty he didn't have like a lot of jobs that were manual labor or anything like that and from the time he was a little kid, people noticed he was good at football. Right. And so once that happened, you know, he, he, he was sort of laser, laser focused in that direction. Football and basketball, he was really good at basketball too. Yep. But once he, you know, once people realized he was an athlete and could maybe make some of himself as an athlete, I think he wasn't asked to do 
a lot of the other work that a lot of people do just sort of par for the course growing up. Yeah. And it is really interesting to think about if he had been born in a setting where he would have had to do a lot of manual labor, would his life have turned out differently? And, and the big question for me along those lines is, you know, if his mom and dad hadn't separated, you know, I think a big thing in his family was, especially with his dad, that food was the way they bonded. Yes. Um, I think I have in that story that his dad would come home from work with two boxes of Little Debbie's and two two liter bottles of Mountain Dew. Yep. And they would sit down and watch TV and split them up. And that was how they bonded with each other. You know, other families bond by doing projects together, or by like chopping wood together or, or working on cars together or whatever it is. You know, they bonded over Little Debbie and Mountain Dew. And that, I think, played a huge part in his development, that that food was a way he found a connection with somebody he was really dear to. And so it's no no surprise that he looked for food as a way to connect and for love and all that sort of thing as he got older, too. It, it's, it's wild because I, I'm thinking about, you know, when I read your story, you know, our parents are only doing the best they can with what they have. You know, right. your your dad was working, he would sneak you home and, and give you a, a snack cake and a whatever. And, and I'm sure it was the same way for him, you know, lower middle class, middle class, whatever you want to call it. You know, I, you know, everybody remember, and it's still to this day, why Fridays still feel like whatever, it's got to be pizza night, right? Because mom got, somebody got paid in the house and we at least going to go to the Pizza Hut or, you know, something, or I'm, I get to go to the gas station on Saturday morning before my little league game and get whatever I want, you know what I'm saying? And then, but that's when you get a generation of, of adults living out of the gas station, you know, getting all of their meals off the turnstiles of whatever's hot and whatever's in the bag. And ultimately, you know, our parents are trying to do the best for us, but it's really tough. Did Jared express concern for about his three kids, like, you know, are they going to like pick up my, I want to try to figure out a way to break this for him. Did he, was he even really cognizant of that, aware of that? Yeah, he did talk about that. And his kids um, seem to be pretty active, right. you know, when I knew him, which has been, you know, gosh, five, six five, years ago by yeah. now. Mm -hmm. um, they seem to be active. Obviously, their mom was making sure they stayed active because she knew, you know, the genetics that were involved there. Right. And she had been a, I think she played softball in high school, so she was an athlete too. And um, so I, that's that's an interesting question of how those kids turned out or how they're turning out after all this. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think he was concerned at you know what legacy he was leaving. Um, obviously, nothing that he was worried about in the end was enough. Yeah. You know, he it, it was not enough to get him to stop. And that's, I think, a testament to kind of how insidious this stuff can be and how, how much of a grip it can have on you is that he knew, I think at some level, that if he didn't change, he was going to die. Uh, and and he couldn't change. And, and that's, you know, as much as he wanted to, for the sake of his family, for the sake of just living a, a longer, more healthy life, um, he was not able in the end to turn it around. And so that, I, to me, that speaks to how hard it is because he had lots to live for and could not find a way to, to change enough to, to make him live as long as he should have. It, it was interesting you brought up the point that, you know, we play a game like kids and that Jared kept... He's, he's kind of like a, how a lot of us are when we get to, or if we've ever, and Preston brings this point up, the longer you play, the harder it is to make that transition, um, especially for NFL dudes or those guys who played two or three years and then they hang on for another 10. And Jared was definitely a guy who, like you said, had physical, just God-given talent. Doesn't matter how much he weighed, he was still out there slinging touchdowns, green at two, right. green at three. That does seem like it was such a convenient thing for him 
Because again, it would have been different if he went out there and he still didn't have the arm. Or, but he was still 400 pounds and shaking dudes. And even to that last play where he yeah. broke his ankle, like he, he made a couple dudes miss. And those dudes were in their prime, you know? So it's like, it seems like it was really set up for him to like kind of ultimately fall because like that was still lingering there as opposed to him saying, you know what, man, I'm done. I'm too big to be doing this. Let me go be, you know, a sales manager or whatever. And again, he tried different jobs, but there was nothing to replicate what he got on the football field. I think he, he was an athletic freak in the same way, a similar way anyway, that like early Charles Barkley was. You know, like Barkley, when you first saw him when he was in at Auburn in his early days in the NBA, you're like, how does that dude even jump that high at that size? You know, he had he had gifts that it seemed were impossible mm -hmm. for somebody as big as he was to do that. Barkley, I think, to his great credit, figured out that he would not he couldn't be what he wanted to be. He would never be truly great until he got in better shape and he did it. You know, he, he slimmed down and obviously had, you know, he's a hall of famer, mm -hmm. one of the greatest players of all time. And I think Jared, in some ways, his gifts allowed him to coast, you know, if he had been a little less talented, he would have had to work harder, get in better shape to do what he wanted to do. But just think about that dude at like, 330 pounds as a quarterback or whatever made it to the NFL. You know, he didn't play much, but he made it. He, he got on a roster. He got a Super Bowl ring. You know, that he guy got on a roster on a team that drafted Eli Manning, which, uh, yes, that's kind of like a debt. You're a fool if anybody, if you're a free agent and you choose to go to the team that picks anybody in your position. Yeah, right. But he went for the place that went first overall. So, that also kind yeah. of seems like his competition too, but I mean, yeah, and that and that just it's all that's uh, a testament to the incredible athletic gifts he had. Um, unfortunately, you know, he didn't make. I, I, well, it's hard to say that somebody who made it to the NFL didn't fully maximize their talents because yeah. he went further than 99.9% .9 of people ever do. Right. But you do wonder if he had been more dedicated and had gotten in better shape, what he could have been. And I think that's the story of his life in a lot of ways, is what he could have been. You it know, he, really for one thing, he could have been this incredible player, he could have been a better husband and father, and he could have just lived a longer life right. had he been able to overcome this thing that just overwhelmed yeah, there's, a, there's a really great story about sort of like Charles Barkley when he first came in the league and like you said he was you know he was he was the weight that he was you know the round mound of rebound and you know all of those types of things and uh you know obviously with, with Charles's personality you know the, the the kind of the idea of training and dedication and losing weight was not really his thing but you know, he had Moses Malone on the team when he got there. And Moses basically said, man, you're a fat ass and you ain't never going to be as good as Kenji until you lose this weight. And he basically took him under his wing and made him do that. And so, again, Jerry probably never had that person or anybody that just put him in his place and just said, nah, this is not the way to go. Because like he said, he was benefiting off of being the pill that drove boy in the hefty lefty and all, all that was good you know it made a, it made a good story but at the end it didn't work for him. yeah and i wonder if there you know if like you said if the right person had wandered into his life i mean you know when he was with the giants i think tom coughlin was the coach and so if tom coughlin can't like you know get you into shape i'm not sure who can but yeah he was able to do just enough to to keep going Hold on you know, during that time because they cut him after, you know. After right. That. Yeah. Right. And so, he had the, you know, he did have that moment, I think, when he got cut by the, I think he got, he, the Giants didn't break him back and they got cut by the Colts. Oh, yeah. And then, um, so he could have seen that as 
a moment to change and try to get back in. But I do think also, I think about um, people with addictions or whatever is that they have issues with self-work. You know, one story about Jared that I remember from my story is the first year, so, you know, he signed with the Giants as a free agent. And the, he didn't go to camp. He was afraid to go to camp that first year because he just knew he was going to get cut. And so the first year, he didn't go at all. He just he didn't, didn't show up. And so the next year, they invited him back. And his wife said, you know, you better go to this camp or you might as well not come back. And so that motivated him to go. And he cried the whole way, you know, driving up to New York, upstate New York, wherever the camp was. I think he never thought he was good enough. And so there's that, that those dueling things in any person who has these kind of problems is like, I'm good enough to take care of myself. I'm good enough to get this far. But in my heart of hearts, am I really good enough? And so I wonder if after the Colts let him go, whether he thought, well, that's as, that's as good as I'm ever going to be and just didn't make the effort to try to get better. It's, wow. you know, one of those unanswerable questions. And you think but, about it, he he won a Super Bowl. So he, he yeah. was there, he was on the team, he saw it, he, and so he got all the, I mean, they beat that 18-0 and 0 Patriots team. So like, right. you know, so for him... That that's something. Now that I think about it, it, feels like a convenient time for him to be like, "This is it," because I was even though I didn't play, I was indirectly. I've, I've experienced it all. I went through it all. Um, that's really interesting to, to kind of really because why would I? Why would I? Why would I have that in me to want to lose the weight if that's the one thing that's holding me back from being not even a starter, but being being Dan Orlowski for the next ten years, right? right. Um, yeah. So, I mean, that's really interesting that you bring that up because I didn't think about that. And we talked about this with an interview with another guy recently about just self-worth, about being an NFL guy. I gave him my own personal story of like, there. I don't think there's ever was a time because I associated money, you know, once I get these contracts, that means they they really like me. Not the head coach telling me, man, you're really good. Not the GM saying, man, you know, you got a spot here. You need to... I didn't believe any of that. And that all goes back to that inner, that inner game, that inner dialogue. And that's interesting that you say that about Jared, um, about that. Did he ever mention anything about, cause I, I mean, obviously that was his high school sweetheart, all those different things. Um, cause when you think about a high performing quarterback, even if they are really committed to their girlfriend, they still get a bunch of, you know, ladies, hey, you know what I'm saying? But yeah. was that a kind I of... Don't, I don't... Re- we may have talked about that. I don't remember. Really? I never got any any vibe from his wife that she felt like he was unfaithful or anything. Mm-hmm. Um, I, that, that is a good question, though. I don't know. To, to get back to the point about the, you know, had, had he done enough, I think part of it also might have been, you know, once he got to the NFL... Obviously, just by being in the locker room, he had to see how hard some of those guys worked, right? The guys who had to grind it out to get there, the guys who maybe not as naturally gifted as him, who had to really bust it to stay in the league and to stay on the team or whatever. And he might have decided, you know, I don't want to put in that kind of effort. And I think some people get there and decide, man, if that's what it takes, I'm not doing it anymore. The other thing you mentioned, uh, Preston, when you're telling the story about Moses Malone and Barkley, um, you know, Ohio State wanted him to come and play defensive end. Somebody else wanted him to right. go play offense. Um, he was dead set on playing quarterback. But he went to Kentucky at the time, Kentucky early, I mean, late 90s, early 2000s. You know, it was like, you know, you can name the people. I mean, maybe Rich Brooks is still, you know what I'm saying? Uh, I'm trying to think. Yeah, he had, he had like three coaches in four years. Yeah, so there was really nobody to be the Moses Malone for him. I think how, I think in your article, how Mummy was like, yeah, we're going to put him on whatever, whatever. But then how was like, ain't nobody make Babe Ruth lose weight, right? So, man, just let him do the thing. So there was nobody to check in there. Yeah, there's that great story and that somebody, I think Hal told me about I, before, I guess in preseason, they sent a trainer to like be his roommate. 
basically to hold his weight down. And then the trainer gained 10 pounds, you know? And so Hal basically like, forget it. You know, I'm not, I can't control this guy. And that's the thing, you know, there, I think there were people in his life, like um, Lee Steinberg was yes. his agent at one time. Yes. And Lee Steinberg, they, they called him out to a quarterback camp. I don't forget who else was out there, but several guys, who became starters in the league. Ben Roethlisberger was one of the names. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. And so he was around people who he could have learned from and could have become better. And I know Steinberg told me that they, they told him, you know, if you just get in shape, you could be a pretty high draft pick. And he just wouldn't do it. And so he was drafted, you know. And so if nothing else, he would have made more money, you know, just by being a, fourth round pick or something than being an undrafted free agent. And so, you know, I think there were, there were moments. He, ne- I, I guess there never was, obviously there never was the right person who connected with him in a way that could get him to change. I don't know whether that was the fault of the people he was around or whether it was mostly Jared. Cause you think about coaching and especially in the world of college sports, like, Man, there's a lot other worse things you're worried about for your players as opposed to them just being overweight, especially at that time. Right. They're like, man, he can still sling it. He can still run away from the rush. He's smart. Okay, yeah, he's fat. Okay, all right. So there's a lot worse yeah. things. I got this guy over here. He's got a drinking problem, and He's got three DUIs. That's a lot worse than Jared using somebody else's bonus bucks to get extra food. You know what I'm saying? Right. Well, and then, and then until he got to the NFL – he was clearly the best guy on whatever field he was on. You know, whatever team he was on, he was the best player. And so he didn't have to check himself, you know. And, and he made it to the NFL basically by living the life he wanted to lead. Yeah. And so, you know, that's an incredible accomplishment. And so when it came time to have to change that life, he probably didn't really want to do it. And by then it had become – really really hard for him to change yeah yeah it's just, it's just amazing it's just amazing thinking about uh you know because we we played i think we, i think i might have played in his senior year i think i might have played in two years but it's just you know, way back in the early 2000s they used to, they used to do this thing called the huddle and they, all the team used to get together and uh you know but looking at the offensive huddle and you couldn't figure out who was who you couldn't find a quarterback because everybody <laughs> looks the same, right? And so right. until they broke up, you don't know who to you don't know who the guard is. You like is that is that Jared? Or you you know, you look for that twenty two, you're like, Oh, okay, that's the guy. And it was just like fascinating because you know how Huddle looks, you always see big guy, big guy, big guy, skinny guy. And but and that, that I, that's just something that was always like burned in my head the way that huddle looked, because they all look the same. And of course at the time this is like, you know, this is pre-YouTube and everything like that. So you only just kind of like hear the legend of, you know, they got that big ass quarterback down there. And then you see it in person, you're like, oh, wow, he's bigger than me. I can't believe it. Yeah. And, and he was kind of living the dream, right? I mean, isn't it the dream of every lineman to be the quarterback, right? I mean, when that, you know, what you, you want to go back and throw passes and stuff, he got to do it. He was basically a lineman playing quarterback. Yeah. And I so. Think- Really you know, good. he got, and that was, yeah, and um, and he got, and he got attention for that in a way that he never would have if he had been, you know, two hundred pounds. It's interesting. I got a question. Right. Um. Now, for you, for you, Tommy, it just seems like, you know, I, I remember reading this, reading that story when it was published. I didn't know anything about your personal story. Do you feel like your experiences? led you to, to write that story. Do you think anybody else could have written that story the way you did if they didn't have personal experience with food addiction? I did feel like, so the, the way I ended up doing that story is I saw Jared on SportsCenter one night when he was playing for that like minor league team and, and slinging touchdowns for them. And the moment I saw that, I thought somebody needs to write about him and I don't think anybody could write about him the same way I could um, because we shared so much common experience. And, it, you know, so I called him up like the next day or the day after, as soon as I tracked down a number for him and said, 
you don't know me. I write for ESPN. I'm a big guy too. I'd like to come talk to you about your experiences. And I felt like, I hope that he opened up to me maybe in a way he wouldn't have with somebody else because he knew that we share some things in common. You know, the first time we met, we sat around talking about the clothes we got from casual mail and our favorite little Debbies and all that sort of thing. And so we sort of bonded over fat guy stuff uh, right away. And so I think that helped, I hope helped him understand that I would know where he was coming from and I'd be able to tell his story with the sort of nuance and the empathy that, that it deserved. And so I do think, uh, you know, obviously there are a lot of really good writers out there and Jared's story is so compelling that a lot of people could have told it. Um, I don't know if anybody could have told it quite the same way um, that I told it. That's awesome. Um, trying to think. Uh, who, um, in your world of being a sports writer, have, is there any success stories? I mean, you, your story in itself, I mean, the, the track that you're on, obviously you, you wrote about that, but is there anybody who you're like, man, this guy used to be this and he really committed to, you know, is there a Marshall Yanda in the sports writing world? Because yeah. That, again, it always that's seems really like not to be stereotypical, but like, you know, whether I've been in the pros or whatever, there always seems to be, you know, a couple of those beat writers who are just bigger than everybody else, you know, and again, oh, because sure. they're all sedentary, they, you know, they're on the, you know, and you can see it. So now I always, I always think there has to be a success story on the other side where a lot of guys just get it right. Yeah. And I think there's some of those uh, sports writers who played maybe in high school or something, tore up a knee, mm -hmm. got sedentary and, and, and got big that way as well. It's just, the normal ways that the rest of us do it. I'm trying to think, I know I met, there's a guy named Bill Barnwell, yes. who's like the NFL writer for ESPN, mm -hmm. really good writer. I know he lost a lot of weight at some point, like 150, 200 pounds or something like that, and did really well. And I haven't seen Bill in a while, but I, I hope and assume he's doing well. I'll tell you what is a more common story, um, sadly is, the people who lose a lot of weight and then gain it back. Yeah. You know, you see somebody on the road, you know, one year they've, they've gotten really good shape. They're happy. They're healthy, all that stuff. And then you see them the next year and they're sort of back to where they were close to it. You know, the lifestyle can be really difficult. And plus just, you know, I, I don't think there are many harder things that a grown person can do to make that sort of fundamental change, you know, whether it's sobering up or whether it's getting off drugs or whatever, or, you know, getting healthy after being really, really overweight, making that sort of change in your body, mind and heart all at the same time is just a tremendously hard mountain to climb. And I think many people get close to the top and they roll back down again. Um, I know, just for me, I lost a good bit of weight as I was doing my book. And afterward, um, I gained a little bit of it back as we had some family tragedies, some people we really cared about passed away over the span of a year or so. And now um, I'm going back down the, you know, back down the scale again and doing much better. And so it's, it's never going to be, you know, a, a straight, even path for anybody. There's always going to be ups and downs. And I think sometimes when you start to have a bad day, it turns into a bad week and a bad month and it sort of cascades. And that's the real danger zone for anybody who has any of these sorts of problems is you have to find the breaks. And um, that old AA thing, one day at a time, really does become a really useful thing to think about where if you sort of have a really bad day, and in my case, a really bad day would be, you know, a couple of cheeseburgers or a big load of barbecue or a pint of ice cream or something like that. At the end of the day to say, okay, I had a bad day. It was terrible. 
um, I, I should not um, make that effect tomorrow. You know, and tomorrow I get to start over. And, and then in many same ways, that's the same uh, mentality of an athlete, right? right? You get blown out in a game, that doesn't mean you have to get blown out in the next game. It's all, it's a new day. It's a new moment. It's a new game. And if you can treat it that way and kind of compartmentalize it, um, that's a, a much easier path to getting healthy. And that, and that's what kind of, for me, when you talk about uh, confidence, and again, confidence is fickle. You know what I'm saying? There's guys who are super confident in this room, but you put them in that room and they're, you know, they're a shell of themselves. For a guy like Jared Lorenzo to me, he always seemed like a gamer to me. Now, I'm not going to put him in the, in, the, in the pantheon of like Kobe and Jordan, but I mean, there's time where he's never backed down, you know, as far as like, didn't matter. And he would go out there and compete and he wouldn't let his size or any of those things um, affect him. But when it came to just like going all the way with the weight loss stuff, it just, that, it just really makes sense now that you, you're, you're saying a lot of this, these things. And of course you spend a lot of time with them that, you know, I could see how he wouldn't care about his weight on that tip because again, and it, it never really impeded his performance either. I mean, after, after the fact. Yeah. yeah and, I, and I think the other thing is just because you're really good and confident in one arena doesn't mean you're good and confident in every arena. You know, like just, you know, if I was, if I'm sitting down to write a story, I feel pretty confident in my abilities. If I'm going out to like, you know, try to run track tomorrow, do the 100 yard dash, I'm not very confident in my abilities. And so I think, you know, for Jared, I think he was super confident off to the point of being cocky on the field, but that didn't necessarily translate to the rest of his life. And I think that's, you know, sometimes it's hard to take those lessons you learn and, and transport them. Sometimes they transport really easily and sometimes they don't. Also, also, I think, you know, if we just look at this case, and I think it's a lot of, a lot of instances with guys who are supremely talented, you know, he didn't necessarily have to work very hard for his God, you know, for his gifts. And so having to work at losing weight is a, is a new thing for him. He's just, he's used to, like you say, he's a gamer probably in the bad sense where he could just, he just rolls out of bed and I'm better than everybody else. So I don't have to work on it. Um, but it's something that you said earlier really, really made a lot of sense. And I heard one of my old coaches, and uh, he's an old lineman, and I saw him one time. He had kind of lost some weight. I was like, man, you look good, coach. And he was just like, well, he was like, shit, man. It's going to be, you know, I'm good today, tomorrow I'm bad. And, you know, I'm going to deal with this thing forever. And I never had thought about it until I heard him say that until it made sense. And now talking to more people, you just sort of decide I have to recognize like this is, these are the cards that I was dealt. This is the battle I'm going to be fighting for forever. Kind of going back to the A deal. Do you, what do you think about that? No, I think that's exactly right. I mean, I think, you know, even if I get down to the perfect weight for me, if I'm like 205 or something, in my mind, a part of me is still going to be a fat guy. And part of me is always going to be worried uh, that I could fall off the wagon, so to speak. And so, you know, that those cravings, I don't think ever go away. And certainly, you know, whatever genetic element there is of it doesn't go away. And certainly the, the background in your life doesn't go away. It's always going to be there. And so a lot of the elements that make people who they are uh, can't change. And so even if you do transform yourself, if you get sober, get healthy, or whatever it is, part of that stuff that was in you that made you that way in the first place is you can't just take it out. And so you have to be, I think, sort of vigilant for your whole life. I mean, I know for the people I know who have been in AA and have had long-term success and all that sort of thing, they always talk about, I'm sober today. You know, I made it today. Even if they've got like the 30-year coin, they still treat it as a day-to-day thing. And that's, you know, I think a really useful mindset. And I think for 
Some people, it's the only mindset that works. It's an easy way to compartmentalize it. So it's an easy way to, to eat that elephant, you know, just one little right. one little bit at a time. Hate to use that analogy for this, but no, that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> it's um, you know, it's that it's that little bit right there. Um I'm trying to think what other questions I had. Um I think we talked all the Jared deals. Now, for you personally, um a lot of the guys we interviewed, a lot of them talked about goals with losing weight, but we found that like, obviously the number on the scale is kind of like down to like the fourth, fifth thing for them. You know, what's healthy look like for you? Is healthy just feeling good in the morning? Is healthy just saying, man, I, I can get to buy those skinny rocker jeans or, um, you know, a European pet <laughs> suit or I don't, I don't know. What, is, what does that look like for you? Because like you said, this is a journey that you, you know you're going to be on for for a while yeah there are there are a million little things and I'll, I'll give you an example of one so when i get past a certain weight um i have really pretty serious back pain it's like right in the middle of my back it's sort of a like a disc or something it's funky or something in there and i know that if i lose enough weight to take the pressure off of that spot that I can wake up in the morning and I might be stiff for five minutes, but I don't walk around all day feeling that. But if I do keep gaining weight, then I'm going to hurt all day, basically. And so just getting down to the point where my back doesn't hurt anymore, like that's a little micro goal. And so, you know, I'm, I'm at that point now where my back doesn't bother me when I'm just walking around every day. There are other things too, you know, like, um, you know, my, the, the car seat that I'm in, you know, I can tell now it's one of those adjustable ones, obviously. And I can tell now that when I get in there, I have to adjust it closer in than I used to, because I used to have it back basically all the way. And now I don't have to do that anymore. I can do it a little bit closer in. So there's all sorts of those like little things I notice that are little goals and little achievements that sort of give me a boost to make me feel better, you know? Um, and then there are bigger things too. Like, you know, I want to, you know, um, I, I never did growing up learn how to ride a bike. Um, partly because I was so big that I couldn't find a kid's bike that fit. And so I'd like to get down to a weight where um, I feel like there's a bike that can fit me, that can ride pretty easily, so I can just take off and go ride a bike somewhere. That's, you know, I'm hoping for like maybe end of the year, something like that kind of goal, where I can find a bike that fits me well and, and take off on something like that. So that's more of a long-term thing. But the, the main goal, you know, is honestly just to like keep living. Yeah. You know, um, I'm 56 now. I said in the book, when I was at my heaviest, when I was 50, the guys like me don't make it to 60. Yeah. And um, I, you know, I, I, Jared's death at 38 was another reminder to me that, you know, none of this is guaranteed. And that um, if you keep living an unhealthy lifestyle, you know, it can catch up with you anytime. And so I'm trying to just keep doing what I could do and shave it down the best I can to where my body still functions and can still keep going. And that's, you know, my main goal kind of one day at a time is to keep making it through the next day and the next day, feeling a little bit better each time and just hoping to live, hoping to be, you know, the cranky old man sitting on the bench, yelling at people, feeding the squirrels. You know, that's, that's, if I make it there, I'll be pretty happy. That's awesome. I think um, a lot of what we're talking about too goes back to like mental health, psychology, all of this stuff in your brain. And I think your perspective just now on how you kind of laid out is really, really kind of like introspective because opposite of Jared, you know, he's used to big wins. He's used to big throws, big, I mean, I got a big arm. Everything about him is big. 
But a lot of the things you talked about, which are big goals in itself, but they seem small and you might miss it if you're not paying attention. Do you think your makeup as a writer is one of the things that keeps kind of these things in check? Because, I mean, those are huge things. And, and I think people lose sight of those when they just focus on the scale or, you know, my blood pressure numbers or something like that. That's a good question. I, I, I think one of Jared's problems is he tried to get in shape was that he tried to do that really big too. Yeah. You know, he went, he had like, he was on Facebook for a while, Facebook Live, doing this stuff, kind of putting him out there in a way that put a lot of pressure on him, I think. And he was trying to lose a lot of weight really fast, which almost any study will tell you is the wrong way to go about it. That's a, almost a certain way to gain all the weight back. Yeah. And so the way he went about those things, I think was part of his personality, but it also made it really hard for him to be consistent because if you're trying to do this stuff in these big leaps and you have a really bad day or two, then that feels like a colossal failure. You know, whereas if you're trying to do things more incrementally and you have a bad day, it's just, you know, I, I really do like it. It's another sports analogy, but I liken it to baseball. You know, baseball is a long season. And if it, if you get crushed for losing a baseball game, when there's 161 more baseball games, you're not going to be, you're not going to have the emotional makeup to keep going. You have to take the losses and the wins in a little more level-headed way. And I think Jared, maybe this is the football mentality, right? Because there are so few games. Each one has so much has so much meaning attached to it that he saw these things in terms of like big leaps and big, big moments and big things he had to create. And I think when he failed in those moments, that made it harder for him to start back up again. I, I, I think it's a perfect, perfect way to, to talk. Uh, before the final play of a game with the Hail Mary, how much build up? And how defeated the team feels afterwards that doesn't, even though you had a shot, you took your Hail Mary and it was honest and went to the end zone. It tipped around a little bit, but there's such a, and then a, and like you said, with football guys, you got to wait a whole nother week to like go back and get that right. So in Jared, I could see how, again, that wears on a guy emotionally. Um, and ultimately could be one of those things where it makes it an all or nothing deal. One final question for me. Um, a lot of stuff Jared talked about in there about avoiding the scale and avoiding numbers. But when you're a football guy, especially a quarterback, especially as good as Jared was, you're looking at numbers. You're looking at maybe not so much as, say, a Peyton Manning or somebody, but you're looking at your touchdown numbers, your stats. Do you think his avoidance of just true what I weigh, what my blood pressure is, you know, do you think that avoidance – was something he also kind of like set himself up with to maybe fail just because, again, that's opposite of what you do as a quarterback. You're mm. looking at your touchdown numbers. You're looking at all of that stuff. Yeah, I think, you know, again, Jared was a guy of extremes. And as in his football life, he probably had to weigh in every day or every week or at least several times a week, you know, to make weight or whatever. And I think he got sick of that. Um, and once football was over, he didn't have to do it anymore. He basically said, I'm not going to weigh myself anymore. Well, that was too far in the other direction. You know, I weigh myself about once a month. But I also know that I could tell you before I step on the scale now, if I'm up or down and, and have a pretty good sense of by how much, because it's that's how I feel. It's how my clothes fit. You know, it's how my seatbelt fits. When I get in the car, you know, I mean, you may not know the exact number, but you know if your weight matters to you, you know pretty much what you weigh or pretty close to it. Jared knew he was just afraid to see that number. And he saw that number as a measurement of his failure to be the person he wanted to be, right? And so, you know, it's like my mom used to say all the time, if you don't go to the doctor, they can never tell you you're sick, right? And so if he didn't step on the scale, he never had to be confronted with the evidence of his weight. Now, 
he knew the whole time that he was far overweight. But as long as he didn't put that number on it, he could spin a fantasy in his head that he was something other than what he was. And I can make a big so comeback. <laughs> right. And so I do think it's important to see that number every so often, even though I think people are obsessed with it in unhealthy ways. You know, they look at it every day or they weigh themselves multiple times a day and they freak out if, you know, they don't lose a pound every day or something like that. Part of that's just like the water your body's carrying or, you know, your your metabolism or something like that. If you If you pay attention to that sort of micro level, you're bound to be disappointed, right? But if you never look at it, um, you're disappointing yourself. And so, you know, he, he was a man of extremes. And I think that that cost him in many ways. That's perfect, man. That's awesome. Pete, you got anything else? I'm good, man. This is great. We could we could sit here and talk talk all day about this, man. But this was uh I can't believe the time flew by, man. Um, yeah, well, I appreciate it. I was just looking, it's been hour and 20 minutes that's that's a pretty good conversation <laughs> i appreciate it man we got plenty of stuff and and again i appreciate your your candor and, and sharing all your stuff with us man and uh, uh yeah thank you for all of this man because uh it's like i said we've been working on this kind of yeah project. I, I told you i told you a person but man just i really i keep it i keep it right here i read it i read it a lot but man um i just really appreciate you writing that writing that book man because it is it just crystallized a lot of things that i Thought, but to see it written down, man, it's just, it's been uh, one, of, it's, it's, it's one of the best ones I've ever read, man. I, I, I truly mean that, so I appreciate it, guys. But Tommy, man, we definitely appreciate your time, man. Anything we can ever do to help you out or whatever, just always, we're, we're right here. <laughs>